Do you know your state animal? Are you from California? Yes. Do you know the state animal? Uh, bear? Yeah, it's a grizzly bear. What about your state flower? Poppy. Yeah. Now, how about your state marine mammal? Uh, I don't know. I never really thought about that. Would it be the otter? Now, there are 10 states that have state marine mammals, including California, which happens to be the, the gray whale. Gray whale? Gray whale. Now, my question was, why the gray whale? I wouldn't have guessed that in a million years. So after weeks of research and speaking to experts, I found out that the biology and history of the gray whale is actually insane. And sadly, they're not doing too well. We've had a lot of skinny whales, a lot of dead whales, a lot of strandings. So today, it is my mission to one, teach you everything you need to know about the gray whale. Two, introduce you to the heroes trying to save them. Three, uncover the Game of Thrones drama that led them to become our state marine mammal. And four, try to see one for myself. Stick around in the end and see if it happens. Oh, right there, I see it. But first, we need to meet our expert. Right now, we're at the Point Vicente Interpreter Center. Garibaldi. Oh, I didn't know they had spots like that. Yeah. Rancho Palos Verdes to see particularly the southbound gray whales. There's a cove on either side, which the gray whales will often use to rest, nurse, play. Whale watchers who are up on the patio are mostly focused in this one area here to catch them. I work for the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. I run the ACSLA Gray Whale Census and Behavior Project. It's our 38th year, and we're finishing up this next week. Did you start it? I started it, yeah, on January 1st, 1984. I started the full season census. So this year, for example, we're in the middle of what's called an unusual mortality event, the fourth year of one, in which we've had a lot of skinny whales, a lot of dead whales, a lot of strandings. So the population has really plummeted from 2016 before the UME started. It was estimated to be close to 26,000. And then when the next estimate was done in 2020, it was just above 20,000. So they did another survey this year and the counts haven't come out yet, but I'm sure it's below 18,000. And we've seen the fewest calves that we've seen in many years. We've had 28 southbound gray whale calves and 24 northbound. We've never had fewer northbound than southbound. It's a big concern. We don't think they're gonna be in danger of going extinct, but they're definitely taking a big population hit. And although the recent UME is concerning, it's nothing compared to the numbers they used to have. Oh, it's a lot better than say in the 18, uh, 1940s when the population, we don't know exactly, but it may have been as little as 1,000 or 4,000 gray whales. They started getting impacted back say 1865 down in the lagoons in Baja where whalers, including a guy named Scamids, would come into the lagoons. They'd harpoon the calves but not kill them and the mothers would come up and try to defend the calves and they would be killed. So basically it's like going in a nursery school and wiping out the little children and their mothers. And so the population took a big hit because this was their primary breeding areas and nursery areas. They were almost wiped out in the 1860s and then again in the 1920s. As their population started recovering, whalers kind of rediscovered it, decided it was commercially viable, and took a lot of the gray whales. Historically, these whales were hunted for their valuable resources. Their blubber was rendered into whale oil for lamps and soaps, while their baleen, known for its strength and flexibility, was used to create a wide range of products. For baleen, for brushes, or corsets to make women's waist really skinny so they walk and talk funny and pass out and can't hold down jobs. Hello, good. What? Yeah. Got a whale? Ooh. Yes! Fin whale? It ended up being a fin whale. Not the whale we were looking for, but still pretty cool. And they knew that it was a fin whale. Because it arched up and they saw the fin. It was a long, dark back with a fin further back. Okay, let us know when you see it again. Although we ended up missing it, we were still super excited that there was a whale in the area. I love seeing this real time. Yeah. That's exactly what we wanted. That's cool. I'm gonna I mean, it would be cool if we saw gray whales. Really but... cool, yes. It's true that the gray whale population have gone through what looks like a roller coaster. But one thing can be said is they're a resilient group of beings. So they're very resilient. They could feed on a hundred different types of prey. If one food source is depleted, they're able to switch around. They could feed on bottom feeding amphipods, or they could switch to krill, or red pelagic crabs, or herring eggs. They prefer to eat these small shrimp that live on the bottom. That's their primary food source. And they're the only whale that exploit that particular prey source. They have between 130 and 180 baleen plates. Baleen is made of material called keratin, like your hair and your fingernails 
grows in sheets from the upper jaw only. They're kind of yellowish color, look like a comb from the outside, and the plates are fringed on the inside. Their baleen is not too long, not too short, just kind of in the middle. So what a gray whale will do primarily, they'll lie on their side in shallow water, usually the right side. About 85% of gray whales are right lit. They curl up their tongue like 75% of people can. I can't, you could pay me a million dollars. And they form a section. They have two to five pleats on their throat, which expand and they suck in the sediments and they suck in everything in the sediments, particularly going after these little shrimp, and they could eat over a ton of food a day. Yeah, that is interesting because if they have a lot of variety, you wouldn't think that they'd be so skinny. Right, but what we think is what they do is they prefer those gamaret amphipods, the little flattened shrimp that build little tube homes on mud, and that's their preference by far. These amphipods are sensitive to temperature. Two degrees above their maximum preference could wipe out amphipods in an area. The gray whales are going to an area that they're used to feeding on amphipods, and the amphipods aren't there. It could be because of the temperature change. It could be because of ice coverage. The Arctic ecosystem depends on ice and algae. Algae grows under the sea ice. Once the ice melts, algae sinks down to the floor to feed the amphipods. If the ice is too thick, algae won't grow because the light can't penetrate it. Gray whales also can't breach the ice to breathe. If the ice is too thin too early in the season, not enough algae will grow, or the stability of the water column will prevent the algae from making it to the bottom, starving the amphipods. But if the amphipods die off in an area, what gray whales will do is they're either going to starve or they need to search for another area of amphipods or maybe exploit another food source. Most gray whales feed in the nutrient-rich waters in Alaska and migrate all the way down to the warm waters of Mexico to give birth. This epic journey, which can span anywhere between 12,000 and 14,000 miles round trip, is the longest migration of any mammal on Earth. But the question is, why go to such great lengths in the first place? Exactly, it's huge. Why don't they stay up in the Arctic like bowhead whales do and other whales might? And one of the reasons people thought was that when the babies come out, when a gray whale calf comes out, it's 12 to 16 feet long, 1,000 to 1,500 pounds, doesn't have much of a blubber layer. The adults have six, an average of six to 10 inches of blubber for a gray whale. They go down to Baja to cut down the energy issues that a calf would have when it comes out. The water's warm and it's saltier, so the baby's able to float better and could spend the time growing and not have to use that energy to keep itself warm. But another reason is that killer whales are the major predators for gray whales. They probably take or kill 20 to 40 percent of the gray whale calves every year. In the lagoons in Baja, you typically don't see killer whales. In Monterey Bay, I just returned from there last month and we have killer whales that go after gray whales. There's a place in Alaska, killer whales will kill a gray whale calf and stash it for later and the killer whale group will keep killing the calves as they're going through when they have the resource available and then they feed on it later as they stash them away in crevices. Uh, oh. Might be two. Two whales. This could be a mother and her calf. Was this the moment we were waiting for? Oh, right there, I see it. Oh, I see it. <laughs> oh, cool. Where are you looking? Just went down, it was... Oh no. I'm not looking. He said three inches, and I don't know what three inches is. Oh. Because three inches isn't going to help me. Heard that. Did it just die? It turned out to be that one fin whale we saw earlier. And unfortunately, the only photo we got was this one. At least you can kind of see the fin. That was actually really cool. I got to see it. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. You got to see it too? Although it wasn't a gray whale, the fin whale's presence served as a reminder of the importance of protecting all whale species from the dangers that nearly wiped them out. Excessive whaling in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries brought several whale species to the brink of extinction, including the Atlantic gray whale, which was completely extinct by the 1700s. Growing concern for these creatures in the 1970s led to the passage of the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which prohibited the take of all marine mammals in U.S. waters. But some countries, including Japan and the Soviet Union, did not comply. At this time, California needed a state marine mammal, and it seemed like the gray whale was the perfect candidate. By 1963, other large whale species were pretty much wiped out from whaling. Gray whale was the only one that you'd really see migrating along the coast. And so you could just stand right here and be able to see gray whales. And in 1975, they're trying to decide for what would be a good state marine mammal. And we've got one that's called the California gray whale, which now is called the Pacific gray whale. 
but California gray whale and anybody could see it and so that was the best candidate to use as the state marine mammal. In 1975, a bill was introduced to designate the gray whale as California's official state marine mammal, aiming to raise awareness of the ongoing threat of whaling. And everything was going smoothly until an opposition group gathered 50,000 signatures to petition a different animal to be our state marine mammal. And do you know what animal they thought deserved it more? The California Sea Otter. And to get an up-close look at them, we're gonna have to take a little field trip. I'm here in Morro Bay, California, which is pretty much the southernmost part of the Sea Otter Range. But that wasn't always the case. Their range stretched all the way from Japan to Mexico. But in the 1700s, the fur trade decimated the sea otter population. So you see, these cute little sea weasels have the densest fur in the animal kingdom, up to a million hair follicles per square inch. Their pelts were prized for their softness and made into luxury garments or traded as a form of currency. These beloved sea creatures obviously needed protecting too. So when legislation came around to make the gray whale our state marine mammal, an advocacy group called the Friends of the Sea Otter got 50,000 signatures petitioning the sea otter to become our state marine mammal. And let me tell you, they came out swinging. They argued the gray whale isn't even from California. It lived up in Alaska, it bred down in Mexico, and the only thing it does in California is swim by it. They argued it should be called the Mexican gray whale. <laughs> So it came down to a vote. Who was gonna be our marine mammal? The sea otter, the gray whale. It wasn't even close. With 57 yeses and seven noes, the gray whale became our state marine mammal. All that was left was a signature from our governor, Jerry Brown. But he didn't sign it. When asked why he didn't sign it, a representative said, I think it speaks for itself. I think Jerry Brown was team otter. <laughs> He didn't sign it. <laughs> Luckily, in California, a bill doesn't need to be signed by the governor to go into law. So ultimately, it still became our marine mammal. A year later, he came to his senses and signed the bill, making it completely official with his endorsement. Since then, the two animals have gone different paths. The gray whale population grew to a staggering 26,000, while the sea otters stayed around 3,000 and remain on the endangered species list. With the recent UME gray whales are facing, the question is, how concerned should we be for their future? Some years we'll see a lot of gray whales, some years like this, not so many. And people get concerned and say, you didn't see many gray whales, I think they're gonna go extinct. Well, no, if you look at the broad view and you know that we weathered another, or they've weathered another unusual mortality event 20 years ago and made a complete comeback after losing one third of their population. But we feel that they will bounce back. And you know what, there's plenty of reasons to be optimistic. Public support for the gray whale has soared in the past decade, especially with the rise of whale tourism in Baja. Such a great, feeling to know that whales that at one time were actively tipping over boats to save their babies are now bringing those calves up to the boats to look at, at people. And to see that level of trust, not only that you go over, but actually allow your child to come over and check you out, is absolutely awe-inspiring and makes us think, I think, even more that these are animals, creatures, beings that need to be protected. They deserve to exist on their own, not for what they can give us monetarily or food-wise. They have merit on their own and as a right. So to take care of this environment, and it's really a legacy to treasure and to be able to pass on to future generations, rather than being short-sighted and trying to get out whatever we can economically for the moment to preserve it for the future. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and teaching us about gray whales. I'm glad we got to see some, well, uh, a whale yes. and some dolphins. And yeah, thank you so much. Yes, that's good. Is it recording? I'm so excited you got that picture. That's really cool. Wow. Well, we'll be using that. <laughs> yeah, fin whale. And that was it. The day was over. It was so cool hanging out with Elisa. She knows so much stuff about all kinds of whales. But I know all of us really wanted to see a gray whale. I'm still like, I want to see a gray whale. We knew it was a long shot, but not being able to see one was a stark reminder that these animals do need protection. So my brother and I packed up and started driving home. And that's when I got this text. I pulled the fastest U-turn, we drove straight back to the beach and ran as fast as we could, just in time to catch them. Oh, right there, yeah. Where? Oh, yeah, I was right where I was pointing. Is there multiple? Yeah, two. That's a little guy. Nine days since we've had a cow cow. So we're pretty lucky. Oh, very lucky. In his book, The Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling, John Muir Laws says, 
Love can be defined as sustained, compassionate attention. Oh. So mom and cow, number 25. Let's go, 25. Paying sincere attention to another person, a child, partner, student, or stranger, helps us build understanding and kindness. Love of the natural world is the spring that waters commitment to stewardship, protecting and being responsible for something. In this case, wildness and biodiversity everywhere. So before you leave, I need to give you some important information. But first, I want to thank Elisa for taking the time and energy and meeting up with me. We spent an hour and 30 minutes, two hours doing this conversation, this interview, and she's a saint for doing that. Also, another big thank you to the American Cetacean Society for hooking me up with Elisa and honestly being very accommodating to me. You can find information about them right here. Also, I want you to tell me in the comments if this is the kind of video you actually want. One of the things that really excites me is California symbols, and I want to go over every biological California symbol we have, like our state animal, our state flower, our state freshwater fish, and go over the history and why they're important to California and conservation, and I think that idea is so sick. But let me know if you like this idea. I mean, this would be the first video of that series. And if you live in the area of Palos Verdes, Long Beach, LA, this census needs volunteers to help them look for whales. So if this is something that you wanna do and commit time to, you can email Elisa right here using this email. I mean, the whole thing too is such a cool idea. You go to the beach, you look for whales, and me and my brother had such a fun time doing this. And lastly, I want to thank my Patreon subscribers. We have Joe, we have Kang, and we have Honey. If you want to support my channel and support me, the best way of doing that is to go on Patreon. On Patreon, I have exclusive videos, exclusive appropriate content, <laughs> and I'm going to be putting my entire conversation with Elisa on there too. Pretty much all hour and 30 minutes, light editing. And we go over so many things, not just gray whales, but we talk about orcas, we talk about humpback whales, we talk about so much stuff that I think you would absolutely love. So if you wanna check it out, check out my Patreon, here's my link right here. And as always, thank you so much for watching. My goal for this channel is not only to get people to learn about science and learn about conservation, but also get outside, go backpacking, and experience nature for themselves. The more you know about nature, the less scary it is, and the less scary it is, the more you love it. So thank you so much, have a good day.